You know, so if I'm if I'm getting dressed ready to go out, I gotta take pride in my appearance. So I'm gonna work hard to look good. Yeah. If I'm going to go to school and I'm going to my English class, I'm gonna take pride in the writing that I'm doing. If my teachers ask me to do to do a poem, if it's on poetry, I'm doing a poem. I'm not just gonna do five, ten, nine poem that will that will just get me past so I, I don't get detention or for example, so I could I've done it. Now I can get out of the class. Take pride in everything you do. Yeah. If a teacher sets you a target, take pride in doing that target and do the best of your ability and then see what the outcome is. Um, when I started the platform, I had no money, I had no knowledge of technology, I had no investors. I actually knew nothing about starting a company. I quit my job and I remember being really upset because I actually didn't know what I was doing. But when you're passionate about something, you just need to start with small little baby steps. So the first thing as I did is I did lots of research. I spoke to students. I asked them, what are your challenges? What are your problems? How can I create a platform to help you? I did the same with teachers. And once you have like research and you've got lots of people saying that this is a big problem, I then developed um, a, a landing page. And actually, anyone can start a business with not much money. And I would say this to all young people. If you've got an idea and you've spoken to lots of people and they think it's a really big problem, you can buy a website online um, for about £20. I think I, I think I bought it for £20, the domain name. I then paid someone on a platform called Fiverr, which is a freelance platform, to yeah. build my website, and that was £80. So with £100, I had a website that was working, and I had a domain name. And then from there, I went to employers, and I went to schools, and I got people to sign up. And I used things like WhatsApp to communicate uh, what I was doing. I set up Instagram pages, and all of this is actually fairly free. What drove you? Because not many people start building like stuff at 14. So what motivated you or drove you to start such an idea? Well, originally it was just a passion project. It wasn't nothing. It wasn't nothing. It was nothing like crazy because I had like uh, um, I I had a prototype. So um, uh, when I was fourteen, of course, like off the bat, it didn't just look like this, right? <laughs> that took yeah. years of development. Um, but the actual thing, I basically got like sports direct cards, um, and I just like you know posted like pay. Sorry, I like I I um I I glued like um colored paper on it, and I just started writing. Um, what the card will be so just really basic stuff and i just created like yeah. an entire card game out of it yeah and i played that with my friends and family everyone loved it literally i'm not even like everyone loved it um and yeah then my dad was like let's make it into a, an actual product and i'm like yeah i'm down and yeah that's what we are today rather than coming from a point of like judging them and saying right this is wrong and this is right you're this you're that because that can create isolation you're saying why are you telling me that for something's bugging you okay cool let's let's not judge let's be curious and ask questions so like so you you're you're telling me this thing is this a sign to say you want help that's cool like let's not judge like oh no if you want help of course we want help i'm not I'm a nice person and this is a civilized conversation uh, of course, trust is important here. So I think that's the best way. But I, to, um, I did point, oh yeah, I could point out like before coming to university in, in the job market, all the time I did do PhD and stuff like that, but I did do practice work. And one of the, a, 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 a lot of time I spent in prison, prison healthcare, working with men, working with um, inmates. And, you know, um, a lot of them had a lot of conditions because when we do the health assessment forms and stuff like that, it comes up. And I always ask like, people, like, I, I don't tell, I don't like go from the position you're lying to me. I go from the position, why are you telling me? Mm. Um, do you want, do you want me to help you with something? Okay. So I think it's a great way of like uh, a conversational, you know, um, starter, like removing those barriers. Cause you don't know what else might be happening. So that could have been a huge amount of work that actually didn't pay off. And so I think with passive income, it's, in hindsight, you think, oh, yeah, this is brilliant. I've made a product that people just keep buying, even if I'm, you know, if it's all automated, you can be doing anything else and the money's coming in. But it's all a bit of a gamble when you start. And that's the thing. It's like it, it's a lot of work that might not pay off. Yeah. Um, and, and the other thing with passive income is 
it's not completely passive. You still have to do work to promote it. And so although again, longer term, it's it I think it's it's definitely gives you some freedom and flexibility in your time. There's nothing that's I don't think truly passive. You still have to be putting some work into it to yeah. to keep it current and you know help with customers and, and things like that. I want to delve into your second publication now. How did you come about into writing that? Like, how was the planning for that and the execution for that? Hmm. So for this, um, I was informed about some studies which attract the cost of housing restrictions in the US. They found um, that they cost, um, Hizier and Moretti, um, 2019, found that the cost was um, some 9% of US GDP, while Durant and Puget, 2019, found that it was some 25%. So um, I was interested, well, what are comparable figures for the UK? Because um, most of the indicators suggest that the housing shortage in the UK is rather worse than in the US. In 80% of US cities, it's the case there is no difference between the cost of a house and the marginal cost of construction. The housing shortage is overwhelmingly concentrated in New York and San Francisco. In Britain, those figures are like very, very much not the case at all. There are very, very few regions where the, um, the cost of um, um, constructing a house else is like actually lower than the um the um than the market price so the, the so um london B- birmingham manchester uh, uh bristol like all of the largest glasgow all of the largest cities in the uk have um prices greater than this yes. and so, so i like implemented um his year variety 2019's model for the british context because durant and puga's model required commuting data which was not available Mm. I then adapted this somewhat to construct, rather than history of Moretti, which we were able to use data for the US, which went back to the 1960s. For um, or, um, Britain, the British government only starts collecting data on female earnings in the 1990s. Mm. And it just and it does not measure female earnings before that. It does not measure jobs um, by um, region until 1997 either. Mm. And... Um, so instead, I constructed a synthetic counterfactual whereby I tried to estimate how much were the cost of construction in each region, and then suppose that we lowered house prices to that in each region. 